So yeah, we're happy to have Roman Vasur from UMass Amherst. He's going to talk about super diffusive hydrodynamics in isotropic spin chains. Um, all right. So yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's great to see everybody. Uh, although I wish I could use this opportunity to visit California, but you know, hopefully soon. Um, so all right. So today I'd like to tell you about um, you know some recent work uh, on super diffusion in isotopic spin chains. Um, so um, yeah. So you know, basically, I'll, I'll try to just give you a flavor of what you know the problem is. Uh, why it was uncovered only very recently, and you know why I think it's cool and interesting and, and a lot more robust uh, than, than we thought at least a few years ago. Um, so before I start, let me thank my collaborators on this, uh, in particular my postdoc, Graydon Ware, uh, who will soon be moving to Maryland, uh, my longtime collaborator on this, Saren Gopalakrishnan, and more recently, Jakob Denardis and Eneli Hidievsky. Um, you know, so everything I'm going to tell you is also based on discussion with many other people, including ongoing discussions with people in the audience. Okay. Uh, cool. So, all right, let me start by kind of just setting the stage just to make sure we're all on the same page. So I'm going to be talking about a relatively old school topic in some way of quantum matter physics. I'm going to be talking about transport. Okay. Um, so... <clears throat> You know, just to save the stage, um, you know, you have different ways you can think about transport. So here in this uh, in this talk, I'm going to be thinking of a 1D system, uh, more precisely spin chains in general. Um, and you know, you can imagine it's your know, system is going to be coupled to say reservoirs on the left and on the right. Um, you know, can you see my cursor by the way? Yes. No. Okay. Um, all right. So 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 yeah, it's. You know, your spin chain is going to be coupled to like reservoirs and, you know, on the left, you could have a different temperature, different maybe magnetization. So here in this talk, I'll be thinking of spin transport. So, you know, you can imagine you have like a, a gradient of magnetization or field um, and, you know, you wait long enough and you'll have a current flowing in your system and that will characterize transport properties of your system. Uh, an equivalent way to think about this is uh, within linear response regime is to imagine you have a tiny perturbation somewhere in your system, um, like a tiny spin or energy perturbation and say, and you look at the way it's kind of spread with time, right? And so there's a typical scaling of position. So, so the width of that perturbation uh, with time that defines a dynamical exponent Z, right? And so that dynamical exponent can be different for different conserved quantities. You would have in your system. Okay. And so just to remind you, um, what do we expect in general? Well, on very, very general grounds, uh, just based on hydrodynamics, uh, we expect just kind of broad universality classes. Uh, so the most important one is the one we learned about, you know, very early in physics, uh, which is diffusion. And we have Fourier's law, fixed law, right, where the current would be proportional to the gradient of the conserved quantity that you have. Uh, that's kind of the, again, that's the most generic scenario, right? Um, so in a gradient expansion, that's like the leading order. Um, and, um, you know, it corresponds to the familiar case where you have a finite conductivity and it corresponds to a dynamical exponent two in that equation here, right? So the perturbations spreads the square root of time. Okay, so, so that's the natural case and it's the one we all know and love in some way. And that's the one you should expect in most systems, quantum or classical. Right. Um, so another kind of generic universality class that we're also familiar with is ballistic transport, right? So this one is dynamical exponent one. It usually requires some symmetry or some, you know, some, some extra ingredient uh, to be stable. And, um, you know, it corresponds to having a Judo weight. So say this a Delta peak in your conductivity and dissipation less transport. Okay. And so anything in between uh, those two universality classes is generically something I'm going to call anomalous diffusion in that it's unusual and will not fall in those categories, right? And so you can have subdiffusion um, where Z would be larger than two. Uh, so say near the MBL transition is one example in 1D uh, and superdiffusion, which would be somewhere those two cases. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> 
So now that we have like those basics, uh, let me kind of uh, you know tell you the the main uh, the, say the main claim. So the VIS was discovered just a few years ago. Uh, so this paper here is really the one that kind of triggered this whole field I'm going to tell you about. Um, so it's a relatively simple story or simple claim. Um, so you just take one of the simplest Hamiltonians in 1D of magnetism, just a Heisenberg XXX Hamiltonian spin one half. Okay, doesn't get any easier than this. Antiferromagnet, it doesn't really matter. You could take a ferromagnet as well. Um, and the claim is that actually spin transport in the system is super diffusive. Okay, um, and it actually has this exponent three halves, uh, you know, that I defined in the previous slide. Okay, and so those people from the Ljubljana group um, realize this numerically. Uh, so this is some MPO plot. Uh, okay, so this is space, this is, this is time. They start from some initial state where you kind of have a domain wall, where you have higher magnetization on the left than on the right. Okay, uh, this is a mixed initial state, so it's actually at very high temperature. So it's not, <clears throat> so it's finite temperature transport. And you know, and they had very good numerics, they could go to long times and they realized uh, this actually has this anomalous exponent. Okay. And so when this result came out, I think many people, including myself, were very surprised. Uh, and there are many reasons to be surprised because, I mean, this is such a well known model. Like you would think we would know everything there is to know about the Eisenberg antiferromagnet, magnet, right? And it's spin transport. It's not like some exotic, you know, it, it's not some super exo exotic observable, right? Uh, at low energy, it's a Luttinger liquid, you know. Anyway, you would think we would have realized this by now. And somehow, uh, you know, th those people realize, well, there's, there's a big surprise here, okay? Um, so there's been a lot more numerical studies on this. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna quote them all. Uh, here I'm showing just some other type of data. It's been confirmed by many groups by now. Uh, so this is showing some time dependent diffusion constant if you want, and here you see it grows with time. Uh, and it's true at any temperature, right? Um, and uh, here, this is spin one half. This is a spin one chain, okay? And it looks pretty similar. Um, I'm mentioning this right away because the spin one half chain, as you might know, is integrable, right? So it has all those conserved quantity. It's very special. The spin one chain isn't, okay? Um, and you know, if you look at the plots, it looks fairly super diffusive with this power. So here's t to the one third. Uh, so it's the same exponent here, okay? Um, so shortly after this, uh, you know, people really pushed the numerics and realized it's not only an exponent, like I, we I have- asked two, so I'm yes, so sorry, go ahead. can I yeah, ask yeah, go ahead. quick questions? I'm sorry, I guess just to make sure I remember, I actually don't remember this. Um, so in these two cases for the spin one half Heisenberg and spin one Heisenberg, um, you're saying that the spin transport is super diffusive in both cases? Well, numerically it is. So, so you'll see later on in the story, I'll, I'll, I'll argue it's actually super diffusive here. And here we expect it actually causes over to diffusion, okay, but probably on a time scale we cannot access. I see. Right? And so, these, are all, these are all at the very high temperature? Yeah, so you see the temperature here. So it ranges oh. from 0 0.5 to 10. Uh, so, so it's a broad range. And, and can you also remind us, um, if I did the same plots over like the same time scales and I was looking at the transport of energy, what would I see in these two models? Purely, um, purely ballistic for spin one half and you would see diffusion for spin one. Okay. So that's it, I haven't seen the numerics for spin one. I know what happens for spin one half, but I, okay. I would expect diffusion for spin one, but you know, maybe it shows some ballistic-ish things. So at very late times, if you could access it, you'd expect for spin one half energy is ballistic, but spin right. is super diffusive. Correct. And at very late times for spin one, both are diffusive, but if you can only access short times, you might see super diffusion. You see super diffusion. So, so yeah, that, that's gonna be actually the claim of the, of the talk, okay. yeah. So, so I'll, but at least numerically, you know, those things look pretty similar, I guess. Okay. So th right. there will be a difference between those two cases, but-, but right. Thanks. Um, so so yeah. if, I, if I could, what is the crossover point? What, what marks crossover? Um, okay, well, let me get back to this because that's pretty much okay. the whole talk. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's my whole talk. Yeah, so I, I'll get to this. I'll talk about this. Like, well, well, maybe one, yeah. one subtle question then. Yeah. So what, how does the prefactor uh, change between these two scaling uh, regimes? Um, 
I'll talk about the prefactor. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let, let me get back to those okay, questions. You're, you're getting again. it. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, don't worry, I'll talk about this. Yeah. Um, cool. So great. I'm glad there are so many questions already. Cool. So, so let, let me keep going a little bit. So my goal will be to kind of give you a flavor of how we understand this and, you know, in which cases it's stable and which cases it isn't. Um, let me mention that it's not only an exponent we have, like numerically, again, the same group uh, kind of showed that um, it appears to, you know, this whole spin transport appears to fall in this celebrated Carter Paris Zhang universality class KPZ, okay, which is a celebrated universality class of non-equilibrium uh, physics in classical systems. It was introduced in the context of surface growth, you know, nothing to do with spin transport. Um, so that is to say, you know, like if you look at correlation, dynamical correlation functions, you know, uh, the scaling functions, which would be a Gaussian if you had diffusion, here is not a regular diffusion at least, right? Uh, so here is another type of function, uh, which is in this KPZ class. And it tells you there's some kind of emergence hydrodynamics in some way in the system, which is very unusual. Um, and, and, you know, and this is something we actually don't really fully understand yet. Um, so as I'm just, you know, stating results for now, let me also mention that there was a recent experiment. This was published uh, pretty recently. Um, so this is from an actual solid state system. I expect we'll see other experiments in the future, in particular in cold atoms. Um, so this was a neutron scattering experiment in this quasi 1D material, uh, where they show that pretty high temperature, I actually truncated the figure, they go to uh, even bit larger temperature than this, that in some you know, regime where they have low enough frequency, the structure factor scales with that exponent, uh, you know, which is very near 1.5 and is uh, you know, quite far from both diffusion and ballistic, okay? Um, and so finally, let me mention that uh, by now we have a lot of evidence that this is not just the Eisenberg chain and it's kind of a super universal phenomenon in some way, okay? So uh, we had a paper calling this super universality of super diffusion. Uh, so, so basically, if you take many systems, uh, all those systems are actually integrable here uh, with various symmetric groups, that are non-abelian, uh, you know, they all obey this kind of super diffusive transport. Okay, so this is a numerical plot. So this is showing the width of like a perturbation versus time. Uh, this is showing return probability. And, you know, the dashed line is what you expect for this exponent two third or three halves. Okay. All right, so, okay. So let me summarize what I've told you so far. So this is just, you know, I haven't explained anything. I've just given you, you know, uh, what we seem to observe from numerics and experiments is that apparently there's really super diffusive transports in this celebrated Eisenberg spin chain and in a very large class of quantum chains. Okay, anything with a non abelian symmetry. Uh, so the Fermi Hubbard model, okay, in particular, for any U will have charge and spin transport that are super diffusive. Okay, so that's a claim that's especially relevant for cold atoms, right? Uh, but again, you know, you would think we would know this, but, uh, but, but no. Um, okay, and so what are the key ingredients? So uh, what we seem to know, at least from, again, numerics, um, is that we need some kind of non-abelian symmetry, like a spin rotation SU2 symmetry or something bigger. Uh, so how do we know this? Well, if you break that symmetry numerically, you see immediately you lose this uh, super diffusion you either get ballistic or diffusive transport, okay. So I'm super sorry, Roman. can I interrupt no, you go ahead. one question? Uh, yeah. just, just to make sure, in the Fermi-Hubbard case, that's in any dimension or is that is that restricted to 1D no. or? No, so it's it's very, it, it, it's gonna be a very 1D phenomenon though, yeah. So, so all so of in, this is, is, there's no example of this that's known in dimension higher than one and, and or, or there is? I mean, you can have different things in, uh, um, so, so in, in 2D, there was, I think you get diffusion. I mean, there was also this experiment from uh, Martin Zuella and his group, right, where they did this. And I think they measured the diffusion constant there. Um, so I, I expect in 2D, it should be diffusive. I mean, you can have different ways you could get anomalous transport, but not really based on what the story I'm going to tell Got you it. about. Got yeah, thanks. So, so 1D, is, yeah, I should have had this actually in the list of key, key ingredients. It's 1D. So you, you need 1D physics, you need spin rotation symmetry. Um, and so the last ingredient is that, okay, integrability seems to play a key role. 
Um, so, you know, that may contradict a bit the plots I showed you, right? Because I told you, all right, you have spin one half and spin one. So, I mean, we, we do observe super diffusion in non integrable models, uh, but we do have examples of systems where you have a non abelian symmetry and you get regular diffusion. Okay. And for those of you who are curious, if you take a random unitary circuit with SU2 symmetry, you can easily show that uh, spin transport is diffusive. Okay, so at least we have counter examples of, you know, that it's not enough to just be 1D and have SU2 symmetry. Or maybe, right. and so uh, the maybe a, a yeah. comment and question. So it's also known that classical Galilean invariant systems have uh, KPZ transport, and it Very seems good. like yeah. this might be related. This is it. Good. Th thanks, Ehud. I actually, yeah, I should have had, I should have mentioned this. So, so I should say, like in the first point, this is also observed in classical spin chains. Uh, but you're right. So in with here, of course, I don't have Galilean invariance. So for those of you who know, like in in one D, if you take a Galilean invariant system, um, you know, hydrodynamics is anomalous in one D, and you have this theory of nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics that predicts that you have KPZ broadening of the sound modes. Um, so, so here I don't have Galilean invariance and I don't have any ballistic modes moving around. Uh, so, so that's a, a difference. So, um, yeah. so, so there is actually no relation that is that I understand or that we know of. Uh, so, so here it's not like KPZ broadening of a sound mode that's moving ballistically. It's really like, you know, the whole transport is KPZ. Um, but, but you're you right. Could, you it, could it, maybe imagine that there are ferromagnetic uh, ferromagnetic spin waves are are sort of um, Galilean invariant. Um, well, I mean, so, so you'll maybe, see. I mean, so so maybe there are connections we don't fully understand. Let me put it this way: you'll see there'll be like actual gold, ferromagnetic Goldstone modes in the rest of the story. So okay, uh, yeah. but but yeah, we if there's a connection to this, uh, you know, nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics, we don't really understand it at this point. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, so let me like, uh, you know, get going and like tell you a bit about how we understand this. So, you know, in the, in, in the next few slides, I want to give you a flavor. Sorry. So, so my strategy is basically give you a flavor of how we understand this. And I'm going to start with this Eisenberg chain, which is integrable. Uh, and then I'll talk about the most interesting question, which is what happens when you add perturbations and why it's more robust. You know, it seems to be so robust. Okay. So the, the framework that I'm going to use uh, so is known as this is known as generalized hydrodynamics. Um, I you don't need to know anything about this because I'm actually not going to need anything from it. Uh, but just so you know the, the name, okay. So it's basically a hydrodynamic framework for integrable systems, right? So this Eisenberg chain with spin one half it has all those kinds of quantities. Um, and equivalently, you can think of it as a kind of kinetic theory approach for the quasi-particles of the system. And that's kind of the most important here. So basically the spin one half chain Eisenberg has stable quasi-particles, okay? So quasi-particles are of course, you know, uh, familiar to all of us in quantum matter physics. And, and here integrability kind of makes them infinitely long-lived. Uh, so, you know, so basically you can kind of write a Boltzmann equation if you want for those quasi-particles. All right, so let me give you a flavor of how we understand the superdiffusion. How come, how, how do you get superdiffusion here? Um, so, so the key will be to understand the quasi-particles of this system, okay? And so even though I said I was thinking of an antiferromagnet, I'm actually gonna think of a ferromagnet um, and, and because those are actually the nice quasi-particles that are preserved by integrability. Uh, so let's say you're doing like regular, you know, again, ferromagnetic physics. So say you have a ferromagnet to reference state where all spins point in the same direction. Um, so, you know, the nice quasi-particles of a system will be, say, a magnon, say, a spin flip, right? Uh, you know, in some cartoon way, which will look like this, will have spin one, right? And you can also have bound state of magnons, uh, and they are called strings. Okay, so, so those can exist in other magnets, right? Uh, what's special about the spin one half anti uh, the, the spin one half Eisenberg chain is that those are actually stable, even at infinite temperature. Okay, and so even if you take an antiferromagnet, magnet, actually those are the nice quasi-particles one should think about, at least from the point of view of integrability. So it's a bit counterintuitive, um, but you know, they end up being stable. And, and so the claim is they behave like nice semi-classical particles. Okay, so meaning they don't, 
you know, they kind of interact with each other, but they only dress, you know, they, there's some kind of dressing of, by interactions. Uh, but otherwise, those guys don't backscatter or anything like this. So say you have, you know, you have those magnons and bound state of magnons, and I'm labeling those bound state of magnons by a quantum number S, you know, that goes from one to infinity. Okay, so you can have bound state of like a 100 magnons that somehow are stable in that system. Okay, which of course would not really happen in, in an ordinary magnet. Okay, um, so they have infinite long time lifetimes, and uh, they move with some you know parameters you can compute from you know beta on that uh, things that I'm not going to detail in any way. So for example, in a thermal state, we know the density of those guys, we know their velocity. And perhaps the simplest thing is we know their magnetization or spin. So this last one should be intuitive, right? A magnon has spin one, a bound state of two magnon has spin two, bound state of three magnon has spin three, and so on. Uh, so the spin they carry is S. Okay. So this has been known for a while, right? You have all those quasi particles in those systems. Um, so, you know, the, the reason this is still puzzling is, uh, well, you know, you have ballistically moving quasi particles. So quasi particles move with the velocity, right? So you have a gas of those. If you take a finite temperature state, you have a gas of those guys. Uh, they move ballistically. They don't backscatter. They don't interact in any fancy way, right? They only, uh, they're already dressed by interactions if you want. Um, and they are charged, right? So of course, if you have like ballistically moving quasi particles that are charged, you expect ballistic transport, right? And actually this one line argument is why like, transport in integrable systems is almost always ballistic, right? So if you take energy transport in, a, in, in that system, for example, it is ballistic because you have those quasi particles moving around and they carry energy, okay? So, well, that doesn't really explain why you have this super diffusion then, right? Uh, and so we have one more ingredient, um, which is really, I think the key physics here uh, is, uh, you know, some physics of screening, okay? Um, and again, it's not something that's like very new or to integrability or anything like this, right? So um, think of a magnon that's moving in a ferromagnet where you have like domains of spin up and down, right? So think of a ferromagnet at low temperature, you have those domains of up and down. And think of a magnon, so here I'm drawing a magnon, which is a spin down moving in a sea of spin up, right? And think of it moving semi-classically, kind of hopping to the left here. Right, so you have this magnon, which is this spin down that moves around. And now think about what happens if it collides with a big domain of spin down, which in my language is like a bigger quasi particle. Okay. And actually what happens is that it, it goes through, but it kind of flips signs, right? So you have like a flip-flop exchange here. And now you have a magnon, which is a spin up that's moving in a you know, domain of spin down. Okay, so this is kind of a known effect. You can convince yourself it's it's always you know you think think of it purely semi classically, right? So you'll have a you know magnon that just move with the velocity. It's a spin down in a majority of spin up, and then it will get converted at a spin up as a in a majority of spin down. Okay, um, and so as a result, if you think really of the charge that it carries, right, it's going to oscillate. Okay, so I, it oscillates between spin one and minus one. So effectively, its charge as it moves in a big system will effectively go down to zero. Okay, so it's so we say that it's you know it's getting screened, and really that's the main physics of the superdiffusion. Um, so you can do like a back of the envelope calculation of how long it takes for a quasi particle to be screened, and, and so here this generalizes to like any all those quasi particles. They will you know once they collide with the quasi particle bigger than themselves, they will start to get screened. And we know the density of all those guys and we know their velocity. Okay, and so from this, we can get a screening time scale. So you have those quasi particles labeled by S and they'll be screened in this way. And, and so this very simple physics actually is the whole physics of a super diffusion. So only at a given time, only quasi particles that are big that with this label that scales with time in this way contribute to transport. And the reason is like quasi particles that are smaller than this, they are fully screened. Okay, so they're basically neutral and they drop out of the problem. So say you have a spin one magnon, you know, it has collided with many bigger domains and it's fully depolarized and it's completely neutral. And quasi particles that are much bigger than this, well, they move very, very slowly and they're very rare. So as because of, you know, um, okay, the density decays with S and the velocity decays with S as well. So, so there's kind of an optimal 
S that scales with time. If this one third is really the same as the one third in the diffusion constant versus time. Okay. Um, so you can plug all of this in kind of a Kubo theory thing, which I'm going to skip because it's not that interesting. And, you know, you get super diffusion out of that, right? But that's really entirely the main physics is like those quasi particles moving around. Sorry. Uh, that gets screened. Uh, and, and this, you know, and the fact that you have those bigger and bigger quasi particles that contribute to transport. Uh, and that gives you the super diffusion. Okay. So you can plug this into a Boltzmann type equation formalism and do a bit more math, right? But that, that's really the main physics. Um, so, all right, so, so now I'm gonna, you know, the last thing I wanna do in this talk and which is probably the most interesting one is to kind of understand why this is stable. ET, right? Because I had those quasi particles that are stable. Um, so in recent years, we've spent some time understanding what those big quasi particles are. So I say big because when you see when T is large, uh, sorry, when T is large, S is big as well, right? So you get those big, big, big bound states. And they don't look exactly like the cartoon I showed you, where we realized, and that was pointed out first by Vir Bulchandani, um, is that those big quasi particles, they actually look a bit like goldstone modes. They kind of soft like excitation. So they look like this picture. This is an actual plot of what this looks like. Uh, so we call we called them Goldstone-like solitons. So they're solitons because they move ballistically, right? They're quasi-particles. But if you look at a spin texture, it's kind of a soft excitation here. So it has very low energy, right? So if you have actually the energy of those guys of size S is one of S. Okay, so they're very, very slow like vacuum rotation. Okay. Um, and, and this is going to have a key role, actually, of why this is stable uh, to a large extent. Okay. Um, okay, so in, in the last like five minutes that I have or something, I, I want to like, uh, you know, address what I think is the most interesting question of all of this. Is like, why on earth is this stable and why do we see this in spin one? Why do we see this in experiments? Right, I mean, this, you know, the solid state system certainly has many things that break into gravity. Uh, you know, <laughs> there, there are many other features here. Come on, can, can I ask one more question on the previous? Yeah, please, please do. No. Okay. Yeah. So, so I just want to get a sense. So somehow, like, I, so we've been focusing, I mean, you mentioned these two things, one, which is super diffusion with this um, Z equals three halves exponent. And then yeah. you've also mentioned this, you know, KPZ universality class. Yeah. I just want to get a feeling. I, I know they're not exactly equivalent, but is the general feeling or the general gist that whenever you see Z equals three halves, more or less, it has to be KPZ? <laughs> or like, I mean, is it, yeah. is it like, it's hard so, to get it, something it, that's not KPZ if you have Z equals three halves, or are they equivalent in spirit or not? Yeah, it's a very good question. So, uh, they're not equivalent. Um, I mean, that's it. They're like big universality classes. So, like you know, three halves sounds smells a lot like KPZ. Let's put it this way. Uh, but like, so to this point, let me say we understand the exponent three halves very well, but we don't understand KPZ very well. So there is an argument by Veer uh, from like this Goldstone mode picture that allows you to kind of understand maybe why you have KPZ. Uh, but there are several gaps that are yet that have yet to be filled. So I think the, the short answer is we don't really understand why it's KPZ and not something else. It's something we see from numerics. It seems to be true. Uh, what we really, really know for sure and understand pretty well, I would say by now, is that exponent three halves. I see. So it's still an open problem. Like we don't, you know, it's maybe connected related to Ehud's question of how this relates to like this KPZ and maybe Galilean invariant. Uh, System. So even for the simplest example of the spin one half um, quantum Heisenberg magnet, you can't prove that it's KPZ? No, no, we, do, we, we don't know that. We, we can, you know, we understand many things. We can compute the super diffusion constant, like the prefactor exactly and things like this, uh, but we don't understand why it's KPZ, I would say. I mean, again, there's some argument by Vier, I should say, like there's a, you know, there's a, there's a proposed theory on this. Uh, which I think has some parts, so it's not fully complete. There's some kind of, there's, there's some reasons to expect that it's probably KPZ, uh, okay. but right. I, I think, yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Great. So, so right. So, so the, you know, the last thing I want to tell you in this talk, and again, it's kind of the most interesting part. So hopefully you're all still awake at this point. Um, so, so it's like, why is this stable, right? Um, so I showed you the, those plots, like saying, you know, you have spin one half, spin one, and it looks super diffusive. 
this one is not integrable, right? So the whole theory I gave you doesn't apply. Again, we see this in like experiments as well. Um, and I should say, so, you know, you think, why is that so, right? So maybe you should think it has nothing to do with integrability. Uh, but here I already mentioned like random circuits, for example, with SU2 symmetry, which do not have superdiffusion. Uh, you can also think of doing hydrodynamics for SU2 systems. So this was done by Paolo and collaborators. I think I saw Paolo in the audience. Uh, so, you know, and it gives you vanilla diffusion. Uh, so you don't get superdiffusion out of this as well, right? Um, okay. So, so what happens if you break into gravity? So that's something we started doing uh, pretty recently. Well, so from the picture that I gave you, you know, quasi particles will decay. They'll have a lifetime. Okay, so so all those nice quasi particles won't be long lived anymore. And you know, we can have a, like a Fermi golden rule estimate of how they'll decay. Um, if you take a generic perturbation that breaks SU two, you can quickly convince yourself that this rate will either be order one or if anything, it will scale with S. So meaning those big quasi particles will decay very quickly. Okay. And so as a result, this whole story that I told you goes down the drain and you get diffusion. Okay. And so we've checked this numerically. So for example, we took like this Heisenberg chain, we added some noise that say couples to SZ, something that breaks SU2. And this is numerics showing the time dependent diffusion constant. So I'm kind of skipping how we measure this. When you know for different noise, so gamma here is the strength of the noise, and you see it goes to a constant. Okay, so we get very nice diffusion constants, I should say. So that's maybe the nice thing, but it's still diffusion. Okay, so all of this story goes away. Uh, but here comes like the more interesting part. So like if the perturbation preserves SU two or it preserves spin rotation, uh, those quasi particles that lead to the superdiffusion are long lived. And the reason they are long lived is because they are like kind of goldstone mode like. Okay, so the reason you can understand this is let's say like those big quasi particles, so they'll slow vacuum rotation, right? They look like goldstone modes. Uh, if you try to act with something that preserves spin rotation, you know, its matrix element is going to be strongly suppressed, right? By definition, this, you know, it's a soft excitation, right? So it's a slow vacuum rotation. So anything that preserves spin rotation symmetry is going to have near zero matrix element acting on those guys. Okay, so that's basically Goldstone, Goldstone physics. That's kind of the definition of a Goldstone mode, right? You have a soft, low energy excitation. And so before, because of this, yeah, you can actually argue, you know, again, in a Boltzmann equation type of framework, that at least perturbatively, this whole phenomenon that I told you about is stable. That is to say, if you, if you put a perturbation, you put Fermi golden rule, you compute the lifetime of those excitations, uh, actually, those very, very big quasi particles that are responsible for the superdiffusion are very long lived. Okay. And their lifetime is actually asymptotically in infinite for the biggest ones. Okay. And so, um, and we check this numerically, uh, you know, okay, so it's relatively short times, but still, you know, we did Eisenberg with next nearest neighbor, with staggered couplings, anything you want. You know, this is a diffusion constant versus t to the one third. It's nowhere near saturating any, you know. In all the numerics, the time scales you can reach, you know, this is still increasing. So we see this super diffusion in all those non integrable cases. And so this is on the right here, it's like a dynamical exponent extracted uh, going to longer times and being optimistic about MPOs. But, you know, and it's still compatible with three halves. You see, it's very far from diffusion. Uh, um, if they're infinitely long lived asymptotically, um, why do you say it's not the asymptotic? Um, Universality class and uh, uh, just because it's second order perturbation theory, okay. um, so so we don't know, you know, that there may be higher order things we neglected. So, but is it a question or or it's a question? We, we know, know it's going to be diffusive. Um, well, I mean, I would exp okay. My personal belief is that probably it's diffusive because again, uh, SU two alone is not enough to give you super diffusion and like so when we have those random circuits. So within this Boltzmann equation framework, the answer is if you do Boltzmann equation, you put a collision integral that comes from Fermi golden rule, super diffusion is stable. Wait, wait, but that, but in random circuits, there is no energy conservation. So maybe that's, maybe right. that's uh, so you can take these, for example, Boltzmann treatments and add some noise that breaks um, energy conservation <laughs> yes. and then you'd probably kill it immediately, right? Um, so, so actually, yeah, so we did that. 
Uh, so okay. that's, that was my last slide, actually. So we also did that adding noise. Uh, we can still do this perturbatively here. Energy is not conserved. And so because of this, your kind of phase space is a bit different, right, of the perturbations you can add in your Boltzmann equation. And here, like the Boltzmann equation framework that we have predicts almost diffusion, but with a log correction. So it predicts like a conductivity that diverges logarithmically. Mm -hmm. And we did numerics and, you know, this is D versus log T for different strength of noise. And you see for small noise, it's a pretty good straight line. Uh, however, if we crank up the noise, you see it looks like it's saturating. Okay. Um, so, so, right. so we have some evidence that, you know, this is really, we're doing a perturbative treatment. So there's probably some non-perturbative physics over there, or at least higher order in perturbation theory that we're not taking into account. Um, so we have some evidence here. I think if you crank up gamma even more, you really see it even more clearly that it's saturating. Um, does that answer your question, right? So, so yeah, 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 yeah. What if you so, replace energy conservation by another conservation law, like um, you know, couple it to a charge, cons another conserved charge, and yeah, a so, random so, unitary circuit? Maybe you can right. stabilize it then. Yeah. So, so the inset is actually this. So this is coupling to a higher order. Like uh, this is coupling to energy current, uh, which is also a C2 invariance. And so, you know, we haven't checked everything, but but it's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it still looks like it's saturating. Um, so let me just wrap up and maybe take more questions. Uh, so, you know, hopefully I've convinced you that there's some kind of anomalous and like unexpected, sorry, super, uh, super diffusive transports and, and integrable chains, at least, right? Isotropic chains. Um, hopefully I've convinced you there's a relatively simple mechanism based on this uh, screening. Uh, integrability plays almost no role. Uh, okay, like it, it's there, you know, to stabilize those quasi particles, but otherwise it's basically a simple kinetic or Boltzmann equation explanation, right? It, it could be about just ferromagnets in general. Uh, you, you really need integrability only to stabilize excitations. Uh, perhaps really the surprise of the last year is that all of this seems to be very stable to integrability breaking perturbation, at least if you preserve SU2 symmetry and if you preserve energy, right? So. Okay, so here we only had log, but again, if you preserve energy and you preserve SU2, uh, it really looks extremely stable. And so there are lots of open questions. Um, we don't understand KPZ very well. We don't understand non-perturbative effects, high order processes in that kinetic equation framework. Um, I'm sure we'll see more experiments coming in the near future. Um, and yeah, and with this, I'll just thank you very much for your attention and I can take more questions. Well, let's think. Roman, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, so yeah, we have some time for a few questions. So people want to ask. Um, sorry. So so the um this this quasi particle with size s, and then um they so like if I focus on a fixed s, are they just doing diffusion? No, they move ballistically. They move, but, but they scatter with the with the one with the bigger S. Yeah, so so the one with so, so good, yeah. So they move ballistically uh, with the velocity that goes as one of S. Um, and so the one with S going to infinity, they technically only do this anomalous diffusion broadening. Yeah. So 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 yeah, I should say there's a there's a regime if you actually make the you know, if you add some anisotropy, like delta, you take an XXZ chain and you take delta larger than one, um, then they actually diffuse instead of anomalously diffuse. Um, yeah. But yeah, the whole physics really of integrable systems as we understand it now, uh, you know, the hydrodynamics, if you want, is really quasi particles that move around ballistically. Um, and they you have different. Uh, you said they can be screened by a bigger quasi particle. Uh, That's right. So you can have a screening physics. And otherwise, they move ballistically with like Brownian motion on top of it. So they kind of what do a random bias mean? random walk. Sorry. Yeah. What does the screening mean? So the screening really means that they become neutral at long times. Uh, so, so, you know, the charge, if, if you want, it's more like their, their like charge is dressed by interactions. And the way this happens is in a dynamical way. So, so Magnon has like a bare spin one. But if it's moving and it's flipping sign, effectively actually it ends up having a dress charge, which is zero. So it's fully screened by an environment, uh, by its, its environment. And the way it happens is dynamical. 
uh, in the way we understand, you know, like, like um, so it takes time before you actually get screened. I have a potentially naive question. So this uh, characteristic scale of these quasi particles, I, I'm guessing there's a distribution of sizes of quasi particles. Yeah. So do, do you have any data on that size distribution? Um, yeah, so we know their density. Um, you know, so so their their density goes as one over s cube, and we know we know all the prefactors. So so the exact density in the thermal states, uh, we know exactly how they are distributed. Um, so so you know, like the, the things we know is we know we have like a, you can throw away all the quantum nests basically, and instead you have kind of a semi classical gas of those quasi particles distributed with this density, moving with this velocity, and having this kind of you know, and they carry some quantum. For each constant quantity you have in your system, like spin energy, they have like a charge under it. Okay, and on top of it, you have kind of this dressing mechanism. I I, I try to explain in some like uh, you know intuitive way, but but yeah. So so that's that's the claim. So we, we yeah we to go back to your so question, I, so we I, know the density. So I guess what was on my mind is the notion that if these quasi particles are moving at different velocities ballistically, they will right. coalesce. That's, I guess, really to that screening mechanism. Oh, so, so yeah. So, so when they collide, the only thing that happens is uh, basically nothing. They, they almost don't see each other. I mean, like, so most oh, so they, they, yeah. they are solitonic. They just go through. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So they pick up a phase shift, right? So, so there's kind of a, you know, there's a Wigner time delay, if you want, when they collide. And that, that's taken into account in that velocity. So if you want, the velocity itself is kind of dressed by interactions. But they are solitons. Because right. so the naivety the of the solitons, they move and they go through. So the naivety um, of the question was that your initial configuration was just a, a, a step, a jump from one spin to another. So right. there, was no, there, was no, there was no distribution of oh, spin yeah. initially. So I was trying to work out how the distribution emer emerges. Okay, good. So so maybe maybe the plot I showed was misleading. So so the initial state actually is a thermal state. So, so it's kind of a jump in the chemical potential, but it's actually at infinite temperature. So, so if you want, it's not a pure state. It's not like all spin up and all spin down. Oh, so you're, so you're quenching the system essentially. So yeah, so the initial state is like a density matrix exponential minus mu SZ on one side and exponential plus mu SZ on the other side. So if you want, it's like infinite temperature with a chemical potential grid or a field gradient if you want. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so for the solitons moving through, you can kind of see it on that plot, right? So if you look at the magnon here, it's moving ballistically, and then it kind of shifts by one side, and then it keeps propagating ballistically, right? So you, you kind of have like a, so, so that's this phase shift, if you want, right? So you kind of have like a, um, mm -hmm. you have a little displacement, but then everything moves in the same way. Maybe I can make a quick comment uh, related to Rahul's question before. Um, so at least for part of these models, uh, the late time onset of uh, standard diffusion um, can be recasted in terms of fluctuating hydrodynamics. Um, so the idea is that, um, so the spin two point function uh, indeed does have a standard diffusive decay, but then there is a subleading tail which decays faster in time, however, the, rel <clears throat> the relative coefficient is very large of this subleading tail. So at the initial times, it looks like the system is not diffusive and the diffusion constant, that's for the case where the diffusion constant grows logarithmically time. Yeah, at least, yeah, it doesn't require energy conservation, but at least it can be recasted in terms of uh, hydrodynamic fluctuations. Right, so, so one thing I should say is here, at least for, you know, like, Okay, so, so the cases you're mentioning are kind of far away from integrability. If you're close to integrability for us, we, we don't see log diffusion. We really see this T to the one third. Right, right. Um, and we, we also have a log here, but I think it's different from the one you're saying. So because again, it's only close to integrability. Once we go away from integrability, it's pretty clear you saturate as well. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, Actually, this, yeah, this, can I, um, it, it, this comment reminded me of something. There, there is a paper by, um, Achim Roche and Aditi Mitra that right. um, actually, you know, they at first thought they saw KPZ transport in a quench of, it, there is no SU2 symmetry there. It's just bosons. And yeah. 
in, indeed, it was in the end that they basically found out that this seeming KPZ behavior was uh, just a subleading term to diffusion that um, right. had a very, very large coefficient for some reason. I, I yeah. wonder if in the non-integrable models, it, it's yeah. So, so that's actually here there is a real yeah. reason for it. Yeah, like uh, yeah. So, so I should say, like, there's a there's a whole history here. Like, of, uh, some other people claim maybe KPZ is entirely stable right away from integrability. Uh, actually, so I guess Paolo, this is your paper, right? So, like, but, but you had a, you know, that, that's pretty much the claim in that paper that at least far from integrability, this is probably because of uh, those hydro tails, in mm -hmm. the same way as in that paper by, by Akim Hirsch and Aditi Mitra and collaborators. Yeah, yeah. What, what we couldn't explain though is why this coefficient of the subleading term is large. That's so it's it. not a controlled by any simple parameters. It's not you don't know why it's large. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, so it's kind of a very clear. large parameter for yeah. So yeah, I should say here we have a little more control because we're near integrability. If you go very far away from integrability, then it becomes even more mysterious why you would see any of this, right? And then maybe you know. That I think it's still kind of an open question, right? Like you, yeah, it's maybe some hydro tail, but you need some kind of unreasonably, well, okay. You need some kind of large parameter that is not, it's not really clear why it should be large, or at least I don't understand why it's large. Right. Um, um, if, I, if I can still ask another question, um, is it possible, um, so in experiments, other than transport, is there another other measurement that we can see is uh, um, like quasi-particles? Yeah, so, so I mean, so the quasi particles, you can prop them in many ways. So they control pretty much anything in the system. So they compute and they, com you know, they control entanglement growth in the Cardi Calabrese well, way. They compute operator spreading, they control operator spreading as well. So well, I mean, example, experimentally, like these oh, experimentally, so, okay. Yeah. yeah, so so experimentally, well, you can measure other conserved quantities, right? Um, so, like, yeah, you, like, so. I mean, it depends on the setup, right? So here for spin chains, we're looking at spins or like particle number for like Fermi Hubbard. Uh, if you could measure energy, like you would see like things moving ballistically. Um, like for other models, so I should say, so this framework of generalized hydrodynamics, it's been applied to say 1D both gases. And here you you see, you know, ballistic transport of like particles and things like this. So so yeah, you, you could measure like any course of quantity that you want. Um, if you're focusing on spin because it's kind of the most well it's the most interesting one and it's also the most uh anyway the, the most relevant i would say uh, but yeah you could just measure other other coordinators mm -hmm. okay thanks so if there are no more questions there uh, let's thank roman again thanks everyone thanks thank much. you very much